Uh, Charlie is a garden coach and consultant, and um, he's a co-host of several shows on television and on the radio, both here in Vermont and in Connecticut. He's also the author, and I will encourage you when we can move a little bit better later on to come and take a look at the books that he brought. And um, he is the author of quite a library of book, um, talking, let's just I'll just give you a couple of names, the Urban Gardening for Dummies, Vegetable <laughs> Gardening for Dummies, <laughs> New England Getting Started Garden Guide, the New England Month to Month Gardening, that can be also very interesting, and uh, one of his recent um, publications is uh, Foodscaping, how to design your garden with plants that you can eat. Um, in addition to that, Charlie is also leading um, tours in Europe and in England every year. And I was one of the lucky ones to go to a trip to Sicily last September. And what a treat, what a wonderful trip this was. So there is a trip uh, planned to go to England and Wales this summer. So I encourage you to ask more questions and to see if maybe you want to treat yourself to something very special. Well, without further ado, Charlie, I'm going to pass the mic over to you and take the last chair that is open here. <laughs> <laughs> Sit in the last chair and uh, we'll enjoy your presentation. Thank you. All right. Well, Thank you all for having me come down here uh, to Middlebury. It is like the home field advantage here because I live right up the road in Ferrisburg. It's like, oh, oh, I got to go. <laughs> Jump in the car and come down here. Uh, so it's, it's great to be here. It's uh, nice to see uh, that spring is coming slowly. Like uh, Pat said, I was just in St. Louis, which is about another zone or two warmer than us, and everything is blooming. You remember crab apples? You've heard of those trees? <laughs> Lilacs, you know? They do bloom, really. Those sticks that are growing right now, they will bloom. So yeah, a few more weeks towards the end of the month, you're going to see a whole change in the landscape. Uh, but before I get started with about eating your home, <laughs> by the way, people wondered about this. And I guess from the back you can't really tell what it is. But this is the Fête du Citron in Merton, France. It's a citrus festival they do in Merton, France, uh, along the Riviera every February, I believe. And this is one of the displays they put together. These are all citrus. These are all lemons. These are all oranges. There's, they have them on the ground there. They got grapefruits and all that kind of stuff. It's a little bit of a gingerbread house a la citrus. <laughs> the French get very creative, right, Pat? Very creative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, but as, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I've been talking a lot. By the way, I was wondering, <clears throat> should we turn the light off in the front? Well, if you can, turn the, the yeah, the front yes, light off. That would be good. <clears throat> uh, she's waving. Can you see okay? Let's see. Let's see what happens. Is that, how does that look? We're recording this. This is for CBS, is that right? It's a documentary. I think it's 60 minutes. Isn't this 60 minutes you're recording this for? Yes, it is. I thought so. All right, they're going to work on that. While they're working on the shades, uh, as Pat said, I do have a number of books that will be for sale afterwards if you want to look at that. But I did want to spend a little time talking about this trip. And there are um, a number of people here that are coming with me. There's a number of people here who have been with me before. And they still talk to me afterwards. So, well, <laughs> some of them do, right, Maggie? Where is she now? <laughs> this is a trip um, that we're doing this summer, which is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to go to England in the summer. And I know people are really busy in the summer. With, and who wants to leave Vermont in the summer, right? It's beautiful out. And you got gardens, you got family reunions, you got weddings, you got this and that. But if you really want to see gardens that look beautiful and you want to go to the English, see English gardens, this is the time of year to go. Is in, think of what your gardens look like in, in July, right? They're beautiful. Well, it's kind of like that in England, too. The full glory of the perennials, the flowering trees, bulbs, summer bulbs blooming, all of that's going to be happening. And we're going to start off in the, the London area because the reason we're going this week in July is because for one week they have a, a show called the Hampton Court Flower Show at Hampton Court Palace. This is the largest outdoor flower show in the world. 
you know, the whole thing, the world. Uh, it's kind of like Chelsea Flower Show, but bigger. And because it's happening in the summer, they don't have to work so hard to force plants into bloom. And they have designers from around the world coming in, doing all these different demonstration gardens. It's a whole festival for a week. And so we're going to start there. And then we're going to spend two or three days around the London area visiting famous gardens like Kew Gardens and uh, perhaps over to Sissinghurst Castle and Seville Gardens and uh, Wisley Gardens, a number of different gardens with the whole idea that eventually we're going to hand over to High Clear Castle. Does anyone know what High Clear Castle is yeah, famous maybe. for? Oh my god, the Yanks are coming. Is that true? <laughs> Cora, the Yanks are here. <laughs> yes, we're going to go to Downton Abbey. And you can go there as a tourist, but we have set up an exclusive tour, just our group, with Lady Carnivon, who is the owner of the house. And we will have tea and scones with Lady. We'll all have to practice our pinkies. Yes. <laughs> and she'll tell us the history of the house and wander around the house and the grounds. They do have gardens there, too. So we'll see all of that. So that's going to be really a, tr a treat. <laughs> then from there, we'll head up towards Birmingham. We'll stop at an organic research garden that's been going for 50, 100 years or so. It does all kinds of work. Actually, if a number of you are master gardeners, they do a lot of training of master gardeners there and master composters. They do a lot of pollinator garden stuff. Really interesting place. So we're going to stop there. We're going to stop at Warwick Castle, maybe do a little jousting just for fun. <laughs> Ride some horses, jousting. You know. Go to a few other gardens in that area with the whole idea of ending up over in northern Wales. In northern Wales, anyone ever been to northern Wales? So some of you have. It's this beautiful area. We'll go to Snowdonia National Park. Uh, which has these beautiful mountains and lakes and there's vistas all over. Uh, we'll go to a few more castles. It is a garden and castle tour, so we will be visiting castles. If you're not good, we might leave you in the dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, uh, and to top it all off, the last day, we're going to go visit some private gardens. So I usually set these up for those who have been on my tours in the past, where we go to private people's homes, like master gardeners, garden club members' homes. And we set that up, and we go in, and, and the people are usually very gracious and generous. And we've done that again um, in Northern Wales. They have a thing called the Northern Wales Garden Scheme which is kind of like our garden conservancy uh, program here where private homeowners open their doors to their gardens and you pay a nominal fee and then that fee goes towards local charities. So we're going to visit two gardens right up where we're going to be in northern Wales and they've already corresponded with me. They're setting up the tea for us and the scones and they're going to have lunch. And blah, blah, blah. You went to, a, to Italy. You remember how they treated us in Sicily? It was like we're a long lost family. <laughs> so, what's the wrong? You're not eating. No, what's the wrong? <laughs> So it's a fun tour. If you have the time and the inclination and you've always wanted to go to England and Wales when it's in its full glory, definitely consider uh, checking this out. There are some handouts that are over there uh, on the table. You can grab those, go home, take a look at it. You can go to my website, gardeningwithcharlie.com. The whole tour schedule is all laid out there, too. So. Uh, a one last ch shameless self-promotion. I do have an email newsletter that I do. Uh, so if you want to get that, and if you don't get it already, just put your name and email address. I will sign you up. It goes out probably two or three times a month, all about gardening. It talks about the tours. It talks about other things that are going on, um, some nice photos, that kind of stuff. So if you're interested, you can do that. If you get tired of it, bored, you get, feel like you're, I'm spamming you, you can always unsubscribe. I do not take it personally, really, <laughs> even if I know who you are. So, <laughs> what? Pat, unsubscribe? <laughs> so, let's talk about foodscaping. So, how many people here grow vegetables or fruits in their yard? Well, that's good because that's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> now, with foodscaping, I, I wrote this book because I've done this talk for a number of years. I used to call it just edible landscaping. Then we coined the term foodscaping, which is really the same thing. The idea is that Instead of having everything segregated in your yard, you know, the vegetable garden over there near the garage, the berry bushes over here in the back yard, you got a couple of fruit trees over there, you got the herb garden right outside the kitchen, instead of seg segregating everything around, a better way to grow all those plants is to grow them together, to integrate it all, the edibles, the flowers, the trees, the shrubs, the vines, the ground covers, all of that. And the idea is that it can create a beautiful landscape in your yard without having to sacrifice any of that beauty, you can be growing these edible plants. Because a lot of times people will take the vegetable garden, for example, and it's like, put it out back somewhere, right? Behind the garage, behind the barn, I don't want to look at it, that kind of thing. And that's kind of a shame because vegetables can be very beautiful plants. So this slide is a, a friend of mine who is, I consider, the queen of edible landscaping. <laughs> Her name is Roz Creasy. She's in California. Yeah, so yeah, I know you're all saying, oh, she's in California, all right, you could do this. You could do this too, because a lot of these plants she's growing are, are hardy anywhere. 
Uh, but this is her house, and she has a little postage stamp house, very small, smaller than a quarter acre. And this is the front yard, and every year she kind of redesigns it. If you went there this year, it would be kind of a different whole let it say it, uh, layout on it. And what I want you to do with this is kind of resist the urge to identify things. Because that, as gardeners, that's what we do, right? We go to someone's yard, go to someone's garden, and we're like, hmm, nice hydrangea petiole you got over there. <laughs> oh, look at that over there. Oh, look at that. That nice little bee bomb. What's that one? You know, you, we like to put names on things. And when we name them, we categorize them, and we classify them, and then they yeah, find a little, oh, right over there, you got the seat of honor. <laughs> there you go. So what I want you to do with this slide, though, is to take those glasses off and put the artistic glasses on. And take a look at the plants in here and look at the different textures and the shapes of the leaves, for example. So you take a look at this plant, you see a tall grass-like plant with narrow leaves. This plant has heart-shaped leaves vining up there. You get a Christmas tree-shaped plant here and a little subtropical looking plant there. So if you didn't know anything about gardening, you'd say, oh, those are kind of attractive plants. But we know these plants as corn and pole beans and rosemary and summer squash. So the whole idea is put them into landscapes together. They can actually add some beauty, and you get something to eat on top of that. So unfortunately, this is what the average American yard looks. This is not the average American yard in Middlebury. In Middlebury, <laughs> all the yards are beautifully landscaped with gorgeous flowers. Right, Pat? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely, right, especially garden club members, yes. yes. <laughs> but this is your neighbor. <laughs> we have over 46 million acres of lawn grass in this country. That means it's the equivalent of Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Rhode Island combined as far as land mass. We spend over $10 billion taking care of those lawns, and, it, and it's attributed that 10% of our air and water pollution are due to the care of those lawns. So why have a lawn with maybe a little scrubby tree here, some weedy perennials and a couple little bushes on the side, when you can turn something like that into something that has strawberries, horseradish, blueberries, and some cherry trees. That's the same house. They just decided to put edibles in it instead. So you can grow all those things right in a small little area. And I'm not anti-lawn. It's just lawns have the right place that you have. Now, there's a lot of reasons for growing your own food. It's, it's healthier. It tastes better. You got all these different varieties. But I like to put this slide up whenever I do this talk because it puts it in a global perspective. By 2050, there'll be 9 billion people on the planet. And we're going to have to produce more food in the next 40 years than all of mankind has produced in the last 10,000 years combined. So that's a lot of food. And where is that going to come from? It's certainly going to come from California and Florida and Texas and Central America and China and Australia and all the places like that. And it's going to come from local farms and CSAs and all of that. But I believe also that it's got to come more and more from our own yards, whether it be a small little flower garden, herbs in a container, whatever it is, every little bit's going to help. And it's not unprecedented. We did this before. Was anyone here around in the 1940s? <laughs> God bless you, you admitted it. <laughs> Back in the 1940s, we had the Victory Gardens. Exactly, the Victory Gardens. We grew more, more than 40% of our produce in home gardens and little community gardens during the war. So it's something that can be done. It's just a matter of will. And I see it happening more and more as I talk around the country. More and more people are interested in topics like this and trying to grow some of their own food. So you're in very good company, for sure. So when you're doing foodscaping, though, like any kind of uh, landscape design, it's got certain principles to it. And it really isn't very much different than any ornamental garden design principles that you want to apply to it. First thing you should always do is take a look at your yard or your area of your yard that you want to do and do a diagram of what you have. What are the hardscape features that aren't going away? Where's the road? Where's the driveway? There's a little mailbox there. Maybe you have a big a tree here. There's some underground power lines or overhead lines. Where's the house and the, and the porch? And the direction, too. So you kind of know the, the kind of the lay of the land. It doesn't have to be to scale. It doesn't have to be artistically drawn, just so you have a piece of paper to use as a reference. Then you do what we call a bubble diagram of what you want to plant. So then you decide, well, this is a sunny spot, so I'll put the veggies over here. Maybe I'll do a border of raspberries against the road here. There's a rain garden here because it's a low spot. The sun and shade flowers are over there. So you can kind of dream a little bit about where you're going to put things. You don't have to design the gardens. You just kind of know those are the spaces that I use to fill them in. And then you start adding some design concept. This is my former home in Shelburne. I used to live there. And it's a little neighborhood, just a little suburban neighborhood. And I did that same concept. And what I found is that everything, the best place to grow anything in my yard was the front yard. 
So we're actually, this is from the house looking down out of the window. So there's all flowers and shrubs here. There's a little uh, vegetable garden and then some shrubs there. And this is, of course, is the road. There's a funny thing about growing vegetables along the road or close to the road. It's very different than flowers, I found. When you have flowers growing along the road, people walk by and they wave, nice flower, very good. When you have vegetables, like, you know, cherry tomatoes, all of a sudden it's like a, an entree for a conversation. <laughs> it's like, hey, Charlie, not, well, cherry tomatoes, right? Yeah, yeah, new variety, oh, that looks good, yeah. Are they sweet? Do they taste good? Yeah, oh, that's good, yeah. They're like begging for a sample, right? <laughs> I must have given away half of my garden that summer to people that's coming by. It's like, oh, nice looking lettuce. Ooh, those peas look very good. <laughs> So I decided after a year that I put these shrubs in. <laughs> Enough of that. <laughs> there are people looking over the shrubs. Where is he? Where did he go? <laughs> so first, one of the concepts you want to apply is a sense of balance. Now this is uh, Pat's summer home. Have you been to Pat's summer home? <laughs> over in Belgium. Isn't that your summer home in Belgium? Right. Now this is <laughs> down near Manchester. This is um, Lincoln. Hildeen, thank you. I, was, I remember the name of the Lincoln's uh, estate, but I didn't remember which it was called. Hildeen, so the idea is that you know, when we go to a garden center, even you do this with ornamentals and flower gardens as well as any garden, you go and you find a plant you really love, that heuchera, look at the beautiful flowers on it, I want that one, or uh, a beautiful nine bark, it's a different colored leaf or something like that. So you buy one of this, one of that, right? And then you put it in the garden. If you do that for a few years, you end up having kind of a hodgepodge of a garden, right? A little of this, a little of that, and a lot of nothing. <laughs> and it doesn't really feel like it's kind of held together. It just looks like a collector's garden, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the ways you can get around that is to create a sense of balance in the garden. And to create a sense of balance, balance, I always tell people, reduce the palette size of what you're growing, the diversity of things, and increase how many of each one of those you're growing. And then repeat the plants. So for example, this is a very formal garden at Hildeen uh, with the boxwood hedges and everything, but you can see here there's crocosmia and there's crocosmia there. There's echinacea there, echinacea there. Phlox, phlox. So they're repeating it back and forth. And when you do that, it doesn't have to be as formal as this, but when you do that through your yard or through your garden, it really pulls the whole garden together. It looks more uniform. Form. And you can, don't have to do it with the exact same plant, you can repeat colors. This is an English flower border, probably like what we will see this summer, things like this, where they're repeating colors, like this blue is repeated throughout the border, and the yellow is repeated throughout the border. Anything like that is going to hold it together and feel like more of a unified garden. So instead of going out and picking a little of this and a little of that, decide on one plant you love and get three or four or five of them and put them in there instead of getting one of five different kinds of plants. It's going to make the garden feel a little more uh, well designed and, and look like it's really kind of holding together. Another thing you could do is have focal points in the garden. This is a garden in southern Vermont, uh, and this gentleman is using this gazebo as a focal point. And focal points are just something that catches your eye. And I can always tell a well-designed garden is when I walk into the garden, I don't have to think about where to go. I just, I mean, I, just, something catches my eye, off I go there, and then, oh, there's a little bird bath over there. Oh, there's a little flowering container over there. And it kind of guides you through the garden without having to think about it. It's kind of a really well designed that way. So when you're looking at your garden and your yard and you're trying to design something in there, consider adding some focal points. And they don't have to be as elaborate as a gazebo. They could be, like I said, a, a bird bath, a little container, an old tree, something that's going to really kind of catch someone's eye and draw them through into that garden. Another concept that I see happening all the time is people not using the right plant in the right place. So, how many times have you seen this, right? They got the little the windows, maybe four feet off the ground in the front of the house, and they decide, oh, I think I'll I want to put something in there. Maybe I'll put one of those like little Miss Kim lilacs. They're cute, aren't they? You get them in the garden center. They're about this big, right? They're kind of rounding. Yeah, they're kind of sweet. You put them in there. The first two years, they look nice. Then by year three, four, they're up into the window a little bit, and you're like, Harry, you got to cut back that bush. I can't see out the window. So you're going over there with your hedge trimmers, and you're trimming it away, and then you end up with the little geometric shapes, you know, the little squares, the little round balls. You kind of lose the whole shape of the shrub. So whenever you're doing, whether it be ornamental plants or edible plants, make sure you know the ultimate size. So for example, one of the ones I love talking about as far as a foodscape plant are blueberries. Now it's great to grow blueberries right along your house. They look beautiful, they're great shrubs. But if you get a high bush blueberry, it can grow five or six feet tall. So you don't want to put that near a walkway or near a window. You want to do like a half high blueberry that gets two to three feet tall that stays low and you never have to really do much pruning to it. 
So think about having the right plant in the right place so you avoid this situation where they have a tree right in front of a window. And all you're doing is staring at the window, unless they have a little bird feeder, I guess that might work. But you're just staring out the window looking at the tree and that's all you're seeing. So adding some of those ideas in mind or keeping those in the back of your head when you're actually designing your landscape with your edible plants will help you make that landscape look like it's not a hodgepodge and it really kind of all pulls together. Now we're going to talk about where you can grow edibles as opposed to just I'm going to have a vegetable garden and a, a fruit area. So you can just rip up your front yard. This is up at, right outside of Montreal, a little village up there. And this couple decided that they were, they're a little suburban area. They had a you know, very typical lawn with a little dwarf Alberta spruce and probably a little spirea maybe over there and some perennials. They said, we're going to grow our own food. So they're one of these all or nothing people. If you're one of these all or nothing people, this is what you want to do. They ripped the whole thing out, literally took it all out, put down gravel, landscape fabric and gravel, built all these beds, built a pergola, put in compost. In the spring, this is what it looked like with the trellises. And in the summer, that's what it looked like. Gorgeous, right? Beautiful garden right? in the landscape. They got a ton of food they'd share with their neighbors. Everybody was happy except for the town officials. <laughs> they got sued and taken to court because it was against the law to have a front yard that didn't have 30% of it into lawn. So <laughs> they had to go to court. They had to change the ordinance. And da, 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 da. So you do, maybe, depending on where you live, Middlebury wouldn't do that, would they? No, never. No. <laughs> But you might want to just check about something like that. But that is kind of a full makeover. You know, that's like one of the, what's that show? The, the home makeover show? <laughs> Whatever it's called. I don't know. <laughs> Same idea. But you can do it in a couple of different ways, too. This is a friends of mine who used to have a nursery up in the Greensboro area, Craftsbury area. And they had plenty of flowers is what they sold. And this is their vegetable garden, believe it or not. And you can see the rudbeckia, the phlox, some hollyhocks back here, some alyssum there, some sunflowers. But if you look closely, you see some beans, you see some cauliflower, you see some onions. They tuck them in amongst all the other plants. And so if you have a beautiful flower garden that's flowering nicely, you can tuck in a few edible plants here and there. And even if they're as dull looking as a bean plant, they just kind of fit in there because they're going to be that foil against which the flower color will really outstand, stand out. If you want to start even smaller, you can just do a little a walkway. And this has one of my favorite edible landscape or foodscape plants, parsley, right here. And it's dark green. It stays dark green all summer long. It's a beautiful little plant. It's a great contrasting plant if you put petunias or some bright colored flowers. I think that might be some Dusty Miller or something next to it. Um, so you get a nice contrast in colors. And the nice thing about parsley is you could dig it up, put it in a container, and bring it inside in the fall and have it probably through Christmas or so as a fresh herb indoors. So there's also this big plant here that looks like it's a colocasia. Does anyone know what that is? Zucchini. Well, of course. <laughs> That's a zucchini. That's a zucchini on steroids. That's what that is. <laughs> but it's pretty, yeah, a lot of compost. But you can see how it really looks very tropical kind of plant. It's a gorgeous plant. And then, of course, there's sunflowers. And in a minute, I'm going to tell you how to eat a sunflower in a different kind of way. Uh -huh. Stay tuned. Don't go away. <laughs> You can get creative about your raised beds, too. This is something I borrowed from the permaculture school of, of gardening, where you know, if you have raised beds, a lot of times you have a lot of pathway space around them, those rectangular beds, and you end up mulching a lot and taking up a lot of room. So in this concept, what they do is take the raised bed. Instead of making it straight, they curve it and call it a keyhole bed. So they make a little keyhole right in here. So you have this nice bed. It's three to four feet wide. So you're not stepping on it. This is the way in, and you can garden all around there. And if we put a bunch of them together, this is kind of what it looks like. So you go up. You got your little keyholes. There you go. And you got all this is garden space. So instead of wasting all that garden space for pathways, you minimize the pathways and maximize the gardening area that you're using. Uh, and then, of course, containers. If you don't want to go with the whole, I'm ripping out the front lawn, honey, <laughs> type of thing, uh, you can just start with containers. There's self-watering containers now that make it really easy to grow things as large as tomatoes, uh, right on a back deck or patio. And they, some of them come with casters and rollers now, so you can roll them around as the summer goes on. And you're, you, know, you get some more shade and shadows. You can move the plants. You can become really anal about this. It's like, oh, it's 135. I've got to move the tomatoes and roll them across the deck onto the other side, that kind of thing. But you can grow a lot of food. I had some friends who lived up in Burlington and had a second floor of a condo. And that whole patio balcony they had, this is actually a shot from their house. Nothing but um, vegetables and, and herbs and things in those containers. And it's just two of them. And they fed themselves pretty much all summer, just from these containers. And you can get elaborate. This is up in Quebec City, where they have edibles growing in uh, these grow bags on the roof. 
And this is a homeless shelter, which is kind of cool. And they feed hundreds of, of people a year, in, uh, a day in there. And they were able to produce a third of the food that they needed right on their roof. And because these cloth bags, these grow bags, um, it was really easy in the fall. What they would do is they'd empty them out, you flatten them up like a pancake, and then you can store 20 of them in a closet. I mean, if you're really lacking space and if you're trying to do container gardening and you don't have space for those big containers, these grow bags are really nice. Uh, they breathe, so plants grow really well, but they hold enough moisture. And I've used them to grow uh, potatoes, and I produce like 13 pounds of potatoes in there. And it's really satisfying. You know, in the fall, you just kind of tip it over, and all the potatoes come out. <laughs> like, oh, no digging involved, right? You can create uh, green walls. This is uh, one of our bus tours. We went to the main botanic, coastal main botanic garden a few years ago. And this is uh, some cherry tomatoes and some basil growing up in a vertical gardening system. You can see there's little trays in there. And you can either water it by hand, or you can get even a drip irrigation system that would uh, put it on a timer and just water it. And that way, if you're really lacking space, you can have something right outside your kitchen door or right outside the deck or patio that has a lot of greenery and a lot of food growing. And then you can get creative if you don't have any good ground to work, or if you have that lovely, lovely Addison County clay. We love that, don't we? <laughs> the potters love that. That's about it. Yeah. Edible bales, um, straw bale gardening. Anyone ever do this technique, grow things from it? Oh, this is fun. This works really well. So you can, you can use hay, but hay, of course, has weed seeds in it. So if you can find bales of straw, it would be better. And you put the bale on its uh, narrow side up, so it's a little bit taller. And you condition it for two weeks in the spring. Conditioning meaning you water it every day and you fertilize it. I think it's every other day. But there's a whole system. If you go to strawbalegardening.com, they have a whole thing laid out for you. And, and so after two weeks, what happens is that bale starts decomposing. Between the fertilizing and the water, it actually starts breaking down. Then you come through with a little handful of compost. You pop your tomato in. You pop your cucumber, your pepper, whatever it is. Just pop it in and you keep watering. And that's it. And I thought, I was skeptical at first. I thought, there's no soil. It's not going to grow anywhere, right? But they grew like weeds. Because what happens is the bale is really warm because it's decomposing, and it loves that. And all that fertilizer, I use an organic fertilizer, so it's still all in there. They just grew and grew and grew. And what was great about it is that I did it with, um, I think it was a cherry tomato. It was a sun gold cherry tomato. And I compared those to the ones in the garden. They had very little blight on them, very little problems with the leaves because they're off the ground and there's no soil splashing up on them. And I did the same thing with cucumbers a couple years ago, and I had no cucumber beetles on them either. So that was pretty good. And if you have rabbits or woodchucks, unless you grow them really big down here, I don't know. Middlebury woodchucks, aren't they like four feet tall? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they will, yours are, right? Uh, they won't get them because you know, the bale is up high. So it's a really cool way to grow things. And then at the end of the season, you've got a partially decomposed bale that you throw in your compost pile, and it turns into compost for next year. So it's kind of a fun thing to do. If you can't find straw, I have used hay. It, it, it turns it a little grassy. You know, the things start germinating and stuff. But it's not really that much of a, a detriment. It still works fine. You have straw bales at Agway. OK. Pat's selling straw bales at her house. No. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing to do is, is use your edible plants as multiple uses, for multiple uses in the landscape. And that's what I really love about foodscaping, is that you can use them for a lot of different reasons. So you want to create a hedge, for example, between your house and your neighbor's house. But instead of growing lilacs or cedars or hemlock or forsythia, those kind of common things, this person decided to do asparagus. So they grew a whole row of asparagus all the way down. And of course, you know how asparagus is. You know, For four or six weeks in the spring, you harvest it. But then when you're done with that, you just let it grow up to fern. So once it grows up, if you can trellis it to keep it tall and keep it vertical, and that's what they did with posts and a rope here, it actually it stands up about six, seven feet tall. It's pretty tall. And so he just kept it vertical that way. It was beautiful. He had this feathery, nice hedgerow all the, all the way down through his border of his yard all summer. And then in the fall, it turns golden, so you get some golden color. And then in the winter, if you want, you cut it back. Or you wait till the spring and cut it back. So it's kind of a cool way to find a place for a big row of asparagus instead of sacrificing land in your vegetable garden or your flower garden or other places. And then there are barriers. Now, I have heard rumor that there are deer in Middlebury. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to shoo mine from Ferrisburg down here. I can't say, go to Pat's house. Go, go. <laughs> they don't want to do it. <laughs> anyway, so if you have problems with deer or with dogs, like the neighbor's dog keeps going in your yard or your neighbor keeps going in your yard, <laughs> Consider blackberries. Now, if you're wandering around the forest, you go through a thicket of blackberries, how far do you get, right? Not very far. <laughs> so the key is to make it thick. Make it a 
thicket. So make it six to eight feet wide all along the area where the dogs or the deer or whatever it is is coming into your yard. Once it gets established, they're not going to want to come through that. The key, though, of course, is to mow the edges of it so it doesn't keep spreading into your lawn or your other gardens. You know, try to keep it contained. But that's a great use of foodscaping plants because it's a barrier keeping animals out and you get some great blackberries. And these are friends over in Addison County and they had uh, two little girls. They have two little girls, they're older now actually. But when they were little, they have a little play area for them and she wanted to have some kind of shade for the girls to be out there in the summer. So instead of growing wisteria or Virginia creeper or something, she decided to grow hardy kiwi instead. Mm -hmm. Now hardy kiwi is a vine that's hardy to minus 30, minus 40, it's from Siberia. You, need, uh, you have a male and female plant, so you need one male for every six female plants. And once you do that, in three to four years, you start getting fruit that look like this, these little fruits. And has anyone ever had hardy kiwi, eaten them fresh? Oh, man. Oh, somebody has. That's great. They're great. They're, they're like regular kiwis. You know, the fuzzy kiwis you get in the store, but they're smaller. They're like the size of a big grape, the steroid grapes you get from California, those kind of grapes. <laughs> and they're, they're smooth skinned, but when you bite into them, they look exactly like a regular kiwi. They're green with little seeds, black seeds on them, and they taste just like kiwis. So imagine being a little kid, playing in your sandbox, and then in September you just reach up and you're just picking kiwis and eating them. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Multiple uses of plants in the landscape. And then finally, foundation plants, and I'll talk more about uh, blueberries, but this is a hazelnut, a hazelbert, sorry, a cross between a hazelnut and a filbert. And this one will grow six to 10 feet tall and wide. And if you get a couple different plants, they make a nice hedge, actually, because they sucker pretty freely. Um, they produce nuts that you can eat. And if you don't want them, the squirrels will be happy to take them off your hands. <laughs> and of course, it has beautiful fall foliage color, too. So the idea is that you can garden in any nook. This is a garden up in Montreal that I saw once. And it had everything in there is edible, except for the statue. Uh, so <laughs> you have strawberries, kale, raspberries, cherries, and daylilies. All right, here's the question. How many people have eaten a daylily? Thank God. I've been asking that question all across the country and no one raises their hand. I knew I was home when I came back to Vermont. See? <laughs> they know what to eat. Yes, daylilies. You can eat daylilies. In fact, they're delicious. First of all, make sure you're eating daylilies and not lilium lilies. You know, don't eat the oriental lilies, the Asiatic, those are poisonous. Daylilies, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> daylilies are like those orange tawny daylilies you see in the roadsides that bloom. You know, I have a patch of them. They're not the most attractive looking thing, but I still have a patch of them because that's my edible daylily patch. And when they start growing up, when you start getting the, the buds like this size, you just pick them and you just munch on them. You can eat them raw. You can chop them up and throw them in salads. You can saute them. I've tempured them on channel three with Sharon Meyer. I make her eat all kinds of things. <laughs> uh, they're amazing. And in fact, if you go to Montreal or Boston and you go to the Chinatowns where they have Asian grocery stores, you'll see bags of dried daylily buds because they use them a lot in Asian cooking. They're really tasty, really nice, and really nice to have. Can you eat the blossom too? Well, I was just going to say oh, that. Geez. Wow. She's just like whew, sucking the information right out of my brain. <laughs> yes, they are like zucchini blossoms. If you want to do the squash blossom thing, you can stuff those guys and just uh, bake them like a stuff, stuffed squash blossom. It's great too. And if you're really hardcore, you dig them up and you see the little tubers down there. You remove those tubers, clean them up, and you can roast them like a potato. So if you're going to get stuck on a desert island with one plant, make sure it's a daylily. <laughs> So you can garden in any nook or any little cranny. I like showing this slide because this person had a driveway here, it has a little corn patch, and I'm almost tempted to put the little raccoon right up there. <laughs> <laughs> Looking down, licking his chops. Yeah, here he comes. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the plants that you can put in your foodscape. Um, choosing some edibles. This is one of my favorite kales. So everyone knows about kales. You know, you've been growing kale, everyone gets pounded with the information, eat more kale, it's nutritious, it's good for you, all those good reasons for doing it. But there's some beautiful plants too, and this one's called red boar, B-O-R, and it's a burgundy colored variety. And how I grow kale is that I grow it up in the spring and I don't touch it until September or October. So eventually it grows like a little forest that's three, four feet tall and it's beautiful big plants. You know, you spray for cabbage worms and things, but other than that, you don't have to do much. Uh, because if you eat kale in the summer, it's kind of like eating grass. I mean, it just doesn't have much flavor. It's not very sweet and it's kind of chewy. But if you wait till September, October, after it's gotten some frost, then it sweetens up, it's very nice, it's delicate. You make your kale chips, you know, saute with kale, you massage the kale. 
<laughs> it's great. So red bar is a great variety to have. And you can almost imagine, because of the color of the leaves and the stems, that you can mix it into your perennial flower garden somewhere to have some nice fall color, especially as you get to September and October when you don't have a lot of natural color occurring in your flower garden. Then I've got a, a riddle for you. What do you get when you mix a kale or you cross a kale with a Brussels sprout? A kaleette. Ooh, back up, back up, come on, come back. There it is. Kaleettes. <laughs> Kaleettes, yes. This is a new vegetable, <coughs> literally. I got it from Johnny's last year. I grew it out. It grows up like a, a, a Brussels sprout, vertical. Yeah, right? So it looks just like a Brussels sprout going up. Got kale like leaves on it. But if you look along the stems, instead of having little sprouts, what you get are little heads of kale. And you just snap them off like you would a Brussels sprout, and you saute them, and they're delicious. They're great. So if you're looking for something a little bit different, now I always wonder what the, how these breeders come up with these things. I always see them. I can imagine them sitting there with like a bottle of whiskey or something. You know? <laughs> hey, Joe, what do you think would happen if I mix the kale and a Brussels sprout? Oh, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, well, let's do it. OK. Yeah. And so they do that, and they come up with this vegetable. It's like, why did we do that? <laughs> but it's kind of fun. It's a fun new vegetable out there, and, and if you want to have some kale in a different way, you can try this one too. Um, and kale and fennel go well together too. So this is the Lachinata kale. You know, you've probably seen that a lot of times. This is a garden down, I think it's Tower Hill Botanic Garden. It has some cannas, some salvias, the cochiana. But you can also see this ferny growth here. And actually, there, I didn't even notice this. There's a flower stalk going up too. That's all fennel, you know, Florence fennel. So how I grow fennel is that I certainly grow it to eat and you harvest it, but I also leave enough out there so that it stays ferny all summer long, and then it eventually has this nice white, uh, yellow umbel of a flower that beneficial insects love and the butterflies love it. It's a great uh, insect attracting plant in the garden. So it has, again, multiple uses. That's what we're looking for in a foodscape. Uh, so you have the beauty of it, you can eat it, and it's good for the ecology. And then there are heirloom tomatoes. How many people grow heirloom tomatoes? Oh yeah, everybody. Brandywine, Cherokee purple, green zebra. Beautiful colors, really shapes and sizes. There's one variety, looks like this, that I'm growing this year called the, the Bo Wild Boar series out of California. So I'm gonna see how it grows. Uh, the thing with heirloom tomatoes is they're very regional. So make sure you buy varieties, if you're, especially if you're first starting out, that are, uh, have been trialed in your region. So look at seed companies like Johnny's Selected Seeds in Maine or High Mowing up in Woolcott because they have trial grounds. And if they're offering certain varieties and they say they're well adapted to the Northeast, chances are they'll probably grow well in your garden. But the other fun thing about heirlooms is that they have great stories behind them. So I'm going to tell you a story about a tomato, right? How many times do you get a story about a tomato? Not that often, right? This is a story about a man um, in the 1930s and 40s named M.C. Biles. M.C. Biles. Now, M.C. Biles, like a lot of people in the 30s and 40s, had to do a bunch of different things to get by. He was a mechanic for a while. He flew airplanes. He was even a professional wrestler. Now, he lived in Logan, West Virginia. Anyone ever been to West Virginia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's the topography like in West Virginia? Yeah. Lots of hills, up and down, exactly. So, he was a businessman, he was a smart guy. So he decided there's this one big hill on the way out of town through the main road, and he said, I'm gonna start a radiator repair shop at the base of that hill. <laughs> because back in the 30s and 40s, you know, we don't have the, the Chevys and the Ford trucks like we do now. The trucks would rumble through town, they'd go up the hill, the radiators would burst, they turn around, come back down, there was MC Biles Radiator Repair Shop, right? So business was booming. He was doing really well. He got the nickname Radiator Charlie. Now, Radiator Charlie also loved to garden, and he particularly loved tomatoes, but he didn't like the varieties he could find in West Virginia in the 1930s. So he decided to make his own. So right in front of the Radiator Repair Shop, he did a nice garden, and he got 10 varieties that were growing in that area, and he put them in a circle in that garden. He put one in the middle. And he crossed all those varieties with the one in the middle. Then he saved the best tomatoes from that middle tomato, middle tomato plant. He saved the best one of those fruits. He grew out those seedlings, took the sturdiest seedlings, made another circle of 10, put one in the center. He did that crossing them for seven years, crossing and crossing and crossing, until he came up with a tomato variety he loved. Mm -hmm. Now this was like an eight to 10 ounce pinkish red variety, thin skin, just a perfect blend of sweetness and acid with a little sour twang to it. It's a kind of tomato on a hot summer day when you bite into it, oh, the juice just drizzles down your chin. Ah, oh, it was a great tomato. So he would give it to the truck drivers waiting for their trucks to get repaired, and they'd, they'd eat it, and he's like, wow, where'd you grow this tomato? I, said, I did it myself, right out there. So he got an idea. 
He said, I'm going to start selling them, but I'm not going to sell the tomatoes. I'm going to start selling the seedlings. So he started selling the seedlings in 1940 for a dollar a seedling. Now, a dollar a seedling in the 1940s, if you do the math, is like $25. Imagine going to the local Agway and seeing a one tomato, one seedling for $25. But people would come for miles around just to buy them because they were that good. He was able to sell enough of those seedlings to pay off the mortgage on his radiator repair shop. So to this day, this variety is known as Radiator Charlie's Mortgage Lifter. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot of fun stories behind these varieties and play around with them, see which ones you like. I like mixing heirlooms in uh, some of the hybrids too, so just kind of play around with the different ones. Some other great vegetables. We think of peas, we always think of green, right? Green peas, as we call them that. But these are snow peas of a different color. So these, this is an heirloom called Golden Sweet that has yellow or golden colored pods with a, a little, you can't really see it here, but it's a little pink colored flower to it too. Grows up four feet tall, beautiful plant, and it stays golden even after you cook it. Really nice. And if you like purple, there's one called Shiraz. There's another one called Royal de Burgundy, I think it's out now too. Um, it has these deep purple colored pods. So if your team colors are purple and gold, you're all set, right? <laughs> you can have a whole fence of these beautiful peas. Uh, eggplant. Now, eggplant can be tough in our climate sometimes. You know, it doesn't, we get a cold summer, it doesn't really grow well. The key is to put it in a container. Those black nursery containers work really well. And grow varieties like fairy tale that have these smaller, elongated fruits. You'll get a ton of these fruits that are small. They're great for grilling, for slicing. Um, you're not going to make eggplant parmesan with them. Maybe you'll make a very little eggplant parmesan. Um, but they're really productive and, and they're beautiful too. You can see the color with the purple and the white striping on them. There's a number of different varieties out there. So look for those kinds of varieties and grow them in containers. That does really well in our climate. Now, hot peppers are beautiful in and of themselves. This is a new variety that is variegated. So you can see the leaves have yellowish white and green on them. So even when it's not setting fruit and showing all these peppers on there, it's a beautiful plant to look, look for or look at uh, in your garden. So you can mix it in with some of your annual flowers, some of your perennial flowers. And then when the, the, the fruits come up, it's almost like that's the flowers of this pepper. And then if you can grow pole beans, you probably can grow asparagus beans. Anyone ever grow asparagus beans or yard long beans? Oh, there we go. They love the heat, so look for like the south side of your garage or your barn or your house because they like a lot of heat. Once it starts getting cool, they don't produce very well. But once they grow up, you get this variety red noodle and they produce these three foot long beans. Now, you don't want to eat them when they're three feet long because it's a lot of chewing going on. <laughs> so you want to harvest them when they're about a foot long. That's about the right size for them. And this variety is great because it's got burgundy colored beans that stay burgundy colored when you cook them. So unlike a lot of the other purple beans that kind of wash out, these don't do that. And they're very productive and they grow up. So you can grow them on a fence, you can grow them on a teepee, on a pergola, on a trellis, an arbor, whatever you have. Um, it's a really kind of a nice visual having these long red beans growing in your garden. And of course, who's that? Rhubarb, right? In fact, look at how beautiful that plant is. How can you like curse it and put it in the manure pile? I mean, really. And rhubarb is a beautiful plant. Now, if you get rhubarb that just kind of looks ratty by the midsummer, put it somewhere where it gets a little shade. Put it, especially the after from the afternoon sun, and make sure you have really well-drained soil. So when I first grew rhubarb in Ferrisburg, I put it right in the ground, and it just sat there and looked at me. He's like, "What are you doing?" It's this clay soil, and it was just too heavy and too wet. I built a raised bed, I put it in the raised bed, now it's just flourishing, it's huge, it's growing really well. But it's a beautiful large leaf to it, it's got the red petioles, and even the flowers I think are kind of attractive when they come up in the summer. So start looking at the plants a little bit differently, even something as common as rhubarb. So you often will have a lot of colorful greens, lettuces, uh, mustards, different kinds, chagodias, dandelion greens. And I often get a, the question about, well, if you're doing a flower garden, say, in the front of your house with things like lettuces, different colored lettuces, what happens when you start harvesting? I mean, isn't that going to create holes and you'll just have, it won't look as nice that way. So what you'll do is you do succession planting. So you mix and match cool season and warm season plants, whether it be vegetables and herbs or vegetables and flowers or herbs and flowers. Doesn't really matter, but cool and warm season plants. So in the cool season, you have your lettuces here and here and here. And of course, you have marigolds all around. But in between, you have eggplants there. And you've got some basil growing as well. And actually, you've got a little rosemary down here. 
So as you start harvesting these, by the time that's happening, these eggplants are getting bigger and bigger, and they start filling in that space. So you can do the same thing with putting lettuces around daylilies or around bee balm or phlox, any of those cr plants that will take a while to get going. By the time you harvest them, then they'll fill in that space, and you'll never really skip a beat. And so you end up having multiple seasons of interest. And I love all these nasturtiums. Anyone ever eat nasturtium flowers? Yeah. yeah. Peppery, really great. So this person was wanting to grow tomatoes, but this is their front of the yard, and they didn't want the tomatoes to look really ratty because of the blight, right? So the way they decided to do it is that they put all these greens in front of it. So they have kale, Swiss chard, there's another kale, there's amaranth, some basil. And as these tomatoes grow up and those bottom leaves die off because of the blight, you have all these other plants shadowing them or, or shading them, so you can't really see it. So you still see the tomatoes there on the top and they're starting to still produce fruit, but you don't have to look at this ratty looking plant with this, this long stem with the dead leaves on it. So you can be clever about how you uh, integrate the plants in your landscape. And I think we're kind of mulch crazy in this culture. You ever notice that with the bark mulch? It's all over the place. I, I swear the landscapers are driving around and they don't even slow the trucks down. They're just shoveling it out the back. You know, <laughs> get that tree, get that tree, get that tree. Um, so I've been moving more towards edible ground covers. So instead of under our cherry trees, for example, in our front yard, instead of putting it all as mulch, I'm growing things like mint. Now I know what you're thinking. Oh my God, he wants me to grow mint. <laughs> it's gonna take over the world. You've got to be smart about how you grow mint. So in this slide, it shows that they have a concrete walkway around it, so the mint stays contained. It stays in that area, right? So if you're going to grow mint in your garden and you don't have a concrete walkway, put it in a container and sink the container in the ground. It may still root from the, the surface roots, but you won't get the underground roots going in and kind of taking over. That's a nice way to contain it. <coughs> Excuse me. But you can see how beautiful this is. It's dark green. You can make your mint juleps when the Kentucky Derby comes around. And then in summer, it produces flowers that the beneficial insects and the bees love too. So it has a multiple uses, and it makes this whole area look much, much more uh, beautiful. And then there's alpine strawberries, another nice edible ground cover that I like to grow. The nice thing about alpine strawberries is they're little bunching plants. You know, regular strawberries will spread all over the place and, and kind of hard to contain sometimes. But alpine strawberries are little plants. They kind of grow slowly and get bigger and bigger. They have white, yellow, or red colored fruits on them, and they produce all summer. And the fruits are small, so you get a little handful to throw in your cereal, that kind of thing. You're not going to be freezing pints and pints of these. But they're great for kids and grandkids, especially when they go out and they're looking like a little search and uh, find those little berries in there. Um, beautiful plants. And there actually is a new variety I'm growing this year called Attila. And Attila is a vining one, is one that actually does send out runners, but the runners are alpine strawberry plants. So if you want to create a lot of these in one space, that would be a nice way to go. And then ground cherries. Anyone ever grow ground cherries? Yeah, they're great. Ground cherries are related to tomatoes. And what they produce, and, and they're kind of low growing. They kind of arch and they stay low. This is one in a container. You can see these little, kind of like Chinese lantern types of fruits hanging there. And when they're mature, they have these beautiful golden fruits inside. And they have a flavor kind of like a pineapple tomato, kind of a sweet tomato-y kind of flavor to them. Really delicious, very productive. If you grow them once, you'll have them forever because you'll never harvest all of them and some will overwinter and then they self-sow and they come up. And what I do now is every spring I'm ripping them out because they're just like all in this one patch where I grow them. I have too many of them. Chipmunk yeah. Problems. Excuse me? Chipmunk problems. What do you do? What do you do? All these, really? Right. You yeah. should grow even more of them. <laughs> Force the chipmunks to overeat, and maybe they'll have an obesity problem or something. Uh, no, I think Pat has a good idea to grow them upright if you can, and maybe if you grow them in a container and then put some caging around it and do it before, that they, before they mature, then they won't try to get in there because they don't really think there's anything worth eating. So that might be worth trying, is to have them in a container and, and controlling them. But chipmunks are, are hard any way you cut it, because if you have stone walls around and wood piles or anything like that, they love to hide in those, and then they do their little missions going out there and eating things, right? and they go back. Um, but ground cherries are a great, great fruit to grow, and a nice little ground cover to grow, too. So you can eat different flowers, too. Uh, Rosa rugosa, of course. You probably all know those. Rose hips. You can make great tea out of that. Uh, you can eat them like this. They're kind of seedy, but I, I usually make teas or you can make jam out of them too. Chives are a really nice flower, right? So chive plants, they're already growing in my garden. They're coming up. Pretty soon they'll actually get so big that they'll flower. 
And you can just leave the flowers like that. They almost dry on the plant, and they're really attractive. The butterflies like them. Uh, they'll self-sow a lot, though, if you do leave them on there. So you have to be aware of that. Or you can just cut the whole plant down. Just whack it right down to the ground, and it'll grow back up again. And you'll whack it again, and it grows back up again. It'll do that two or three times in a summer. So if you can imagine you had a chive plant mixed and matched in your flower gardens, it would be a way to kind of cut them down, let the other flowers fill in that area, and then maybe a month later they're up and they're flowering again. So you're getting this color that's kind of popping up here and there, and you've got a plant that you can eat. Flowers are edible. And the flowers are edible too, exactly, yeah. yeah. Flowers and the leaves. So the sunflower, I told you I'd come back to it. What vegetable does this sunflower bud look like even before it gets to this stage? What vegetable that we eat? Artichokes, try this this summer. So get these multi-headed sunflowers, there's a lot of different varieties. Cut those flower buds before they open, steam them, and then dip them in a little butter or something, <laughs> however you eat artichokes. They taste kind of like an artichoke, kind of like a sunflower. It's kind of a cool flavor to them. And it makes sense because the artichoke is the flower bud of a thistle plant. So it's really kind of the same thing. So yeah, you can really kind of treat your friends. And I wouldn't be a Nardozzi and not talk about a Gigaudio, eh? <laughs> dandelion greens. Now, you can grow varieties of dandelion greens, Italian varieties and French varieties, that are more upright. And I drive my neighbor crazy because he's one of those guys, you know, trying to do the perfect lawn thing. And he's out there trying to kill his dandelions. And I say, hey, Tom, I got a whole bunch over here in my vegetable garden. You want dinner? <laughs> so these, the ones you can get that are cultivated don't have the yellow flower. And they actually don't flower all summer. They're beautiful green plants. They have the same kind of dentilion, the, uh, the shaped leaf here. And it has a little bit of a bitter flavor, but they're really nice, sauteed with garlic and olive oil, a little sweet tomato in there. Very nice. Easy to grow. Very nutritious, too. Really nutritious. And you might think you don't have room for a little orchard like this, some fruit trees. But if you want to grow apples, you can always grow a columnar apple. So these are kind of cool trees. They only grow about six to eight feet tall. They have little stubby branches, and that's it. This is a mature tree right here. And you got fruit all along the, that main stem. And that's all it does. It just grows that height. So if you're looking for a way to integrate a couple little fruits here and there, and you don't want to deal with a whole tree, consider a columnar apple. Or why grow a crab apple or a flowering plum when you can grow a regular cherry? You get the flowers in the spring, just like those other trees. In the summer, North Star Cherry gives you these beautiful tart cherries. It grows only about 8 to 10 feet tall. You only need one tree to get fruit. And it gives you a little fall color to it as well. They self-pollinate. They self-pollinate, exactly. And you can get um, Stella is a sweet cherry that does that as well. That was kind of in here in the banana belt in Middlebury, you could grow it. No problem. <laughs> uh, so it's a really nice tree. The only thing, you have, of course, you have to watch for the birds. But that would be like a couple week period when you're, you're harvesting. And then after that, you can take the netting down. You've got this nice tree in your landscape. And figs. How many people have eaten a fresh fig off the tree? Oh, I love being in Vermont. <laughs> I ask these questions and no one's done anything. All the people here have done everything. Fresh figs put fig newtons to shame, right? They have, to, oh, there's just a flavor to them, the crunch to them, the sweetness, anything. Now, to get fresh figs in Vermont, it's a bit of a chore, right? But you can grow them. And I've been growing them for a number of years in containers. This is my fig tree. It's called brown turkey. It's a variety. It's been in that container for, I think, four years now. I got over 80 figs from that tree last fall. 80 figs, fresh figs. Most of them never made it to the house. <laughs> I just stood by the tree eating. The dogs were looking at me like, I thought we were going for a walk. <laughs> and it's pretty easy to do, actually. You get a big container. You put your fig tree in it. You want to mix uh, compost and topsoil in that, and uh, potting soil in that container with some lime. They like a chalky soil. You keep them really well watered and put them in the hottest spot you got in your yard. So I had them on the, the south side of our garage on a gravel area there. And they love it. Just keep them well watered because they will dry out pretty fast. They love the water. And they will just grow and grow and grow. And then by August, September, those figs start ripening. And as long as you can get them to ripen before the frost, you've got these great crop of figs. Then in the fall, after your figs are done, it gets too cold, the leaves turn color, they drop. And then you just put them in a, a basement or a garage, somewhere it doesn't get below 20 degrees. <coughs> so as long as you keep it above 20 degrees, the plant will survive. You don't have to do anything. They just go dormant. You don't have to water them, do anything to them. And then by March or so, they'll start leafing out. So you move them back up either in the garage or a sunny spot, you know, protected from the cold, of course. And then this time of year, mine are in the garage. I'm getting ready to pull them back out and put them back out in the yard again. That's it. And you get fresh figs. Fresh figs. Oh, my God. <laughs>
Now, if you want to do something a little more conventional, we have Amelanchia, or service berry. You'll see that one blooming in our forest very soon. It's one of the first trees to bloom uh, in the forest with these multi-stem tree with white flowers to it. But a lot of people don't realize that they also produce berries, these blue berries. And the western version of this, the Amelanchia aldifolia, only grows about six to eight feet tall, and it's called the Saskatoon. And they've been breeding this plant so it has blueberry-sized berries on it. So it's really delicious, kind of a wild blueberry flavor. And it has nice fall foliage color. So why, grow, why struggle growing a crab apple or something that's got a lot of problems when you can grow a native plant that has beautiful uh, flowers and berries and fall foliage to it and doesn't really take much care. Persimmons. Now, that's something you normally think of when you're in California, right? Or in the grocery store or something like that, or down south. But the American persimmon is hardy to zone four. So it's hardy in our area. And meter is this variety. And it's a beautiful tree. It grows 20, 25 feet tall. It's got these avocado type leaves, big tropical kind of leaves to it. it has beautiful fall foliage color. You only need one tree to actually get fruit on it. And the key, though, is that these fruits are very astringent, meaning that you can't eat them unless they're dead, almost rotting, soft, ripe. If you eat them too early, it's like, <laughs> it's, yeah, you're puckering up a lot. But once they ripen, boy, oh. The botanical name of this means food of the gods. That's what that's a flavor. It's sweet, it's custardy, you spoon it out, you just eat it. You know, when I was in, um, I'll tell you this next slide, this is what they look like. Um, after the foliage drops, and then you have all the fruit just kind of hanging on them, right? Kind of cool, you know, raccoons and possums like them. But it w this was a shot when I was in India, and what we did in the fall is that I remember, you should have seen the place I was staying. It had these like persimmons everywhere, because you'd pick them when they're not totally ripe, but you can't leave them on the tree because the animals would get them, and then you ripen them indoors for like weeks at a time. And every day it was like, is this one ripe yet? Oh, this one's ripe. Okay. Everyone gather around, <laughs> cut it in half, eat it. It's just really delicious. So yes, if you're looking for some kind of shade tree or bigger tree in your landscape, consider a persimmon. And mulberries. Now, I know what most people think when I say mulberries. They think of two things. Big tree, I don't have room for it, and it stains. It stains everything, right? It stains the deck, it stains the driveway, stains the car, stains the dog, stains your kids, stains everything. <laughs> So you can get around that though. You can grow weeping varieties or dwarf varieties. Dwarf Giraldi is a dwarf mulberry, so they're small. And you can grow white fruited ones like sweet lavender so they don't stain. And if you've never had a, a, a fresh mulberry, they grow wild in the woods. I go hiking up Mount Philo and there's some trees up there that I go snacking on. Oh yeah. They're really great flavor to them. And the best thing about them is the birds love them. So if you're looking to draw your birds away from your blueberries and other things, plant a mulberry on the other side of your property. Or better yet, give it to your neighbor as a gift. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll talk about a few berries. So blueberries, of course. Um, probably the best foodscape plant because it's so carefree. There are high bush that get five to six feet tall, like I mentioned. There are half high that get only two to three feet tall, like north country, north blue, north sky. And then there's even the low bush ones, like you see in Maine. So finding the right place for them, that's what you want to look for. Uh, get early and mid and late season varieties, so you extend the fruiting from July to September. And the key thing with them, of course, is that they like acidic soil. So get one that'll have, you can lower the pH down to around five or so. Which luckily for us, our pH tends to be acidic, so it's not so much of a problem. Just add sulfur, spring and fall, and that'll keep the pH low, and the plant will grow well. Other than that, in the birds, I mean, there's really not a lot of problems. You have probably heard about the spotted wing Drosophila fly. You know, some of the commercial uh, blueberry plantations have problems with that. It's a little maggot that gets in there. But for a home gar gardener, it's really more of an issue when you pick the blueberries, you put them in a container, and they sit like in a grocery store for a week, and then they start rotting. But for a home gardener, even if the maggot's in there, you're just going to eat it, and you'll get a little more protein, and you'll never know. <laughs> I didn't say that, did I? pollination, do you need? Different varieties? It helps, varieties. yeah. That's why the early, mid, and late yeah. season variety is nice. Um, it does help. You get more production that way. You don't have to, though. You can just plant one, and you'll still okay. get some berries. You won't get as much, though. And then you get beautiful fall foliage color. Why grow a burning bush? And you should not be growing burning no. bushes. No, 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 no more invasive. Uh, so you can grow blueberries instead. And you can put them around your house. Instead of putting a burning bush on the corner of your house, put some blueberries, a little triangle of blueberries in there. It'll be great. You have fruit and you have beautiful color. 
if you don't want to grow raspberries or blackberries like I was talking, there are new varieties that grow in containers. This one's called raspberry shortcake. Uh -huh. How cool is that, huh? A little raspberry in uh, this small container. Of course, like the fig, you're going to have to protect it in the winter, but it's kind of a nice way to grow something on a deck or a patio if you want raspberries. And currants and gooseberries. We don't grow enough of these. I think we're starting to get more and more. But if you go to Europe and England, they're all, and especially Eastern Europe, they're all over the place. Uh, currants like pink champagne or white currants or red currants, you can eat fresh. You only need one bush. They grow three to four feet tall and wide. They're beautiful plants. Um, usually, there's only one problem I've seen with them, and that's the imported currant worm. It's a little caterpillar that gets on them. But if you get on that early, if you're watching for them, you can probably spray an organic spray and, and knock them out, and they'll be okay. Um, and you can also grow uh, black currants, too. They're a little rangier bush, and you don't want to eat those fresh. You usually use those for making juices. And, of course, a French liqueur. Uh, Come on, Pat, you know. Cassis. <laughs> Cassis, there you go, okay. Uh, so yes, currants are great. Gooseberries are nice too. Uh, same deal. Great jellies with cassis jelly. Cassis jelly. There you go. So if you don't want to get drunk eating, drinking the cassis, you can eat the cassis. <laughs> Uh, so gooseberries, same kind of deal. You can get varieties like this red hinamaki. And the key with these and blueberries and cherries, you know, we're often so anxious to eat the fruits. As soon as they turn color, we want to pick them and eat them. But the key is to let them stay on the tree or the bush, maybe another four or five days or so. Let them sweeten up. And, you, and it really changes the flavor, especially of gooseberries, because I remember I, I grew a, a variety once called a yasta berry, which is a cross between a gooseberry and a, a currant, I think it is. Or goose, yeah, gooseberry and a currant, black currant. And I picked it when it first turned black, and it was like, eh, not bad. But then I left it on the bush for another week or so. Then I picked it again, much sweeter, much more delicious to eat. So same thing with blueberries and cherries. Let them stay there for a while, and they'll sweeten up for you. It'll be much nicer. And elderberries. So you see elderberries growing in abandoned pastures, roadsides. They can take flooding. They can take part shade conditions, which is really kind of nice for them. Nice vase-shaped plant with beautiful uh, berries on them. You can uh, get varieties now that have bigger berries, like Adams and Nova. And also, if you're picking these for making jams and jellies and things, you can pick the whole umbel, pick the whole thing, put it in the freezer overnight, and then in the, and you take it out the next day, just bang it a few times. All the, all the berries drop, and you, all the stems just stay there. So you don't have to pick them individually. <laughs> kind of a little cute. <laughs> and of course, the flowers are beautiful, too. And they attract beneficials. And you can eat them. You can make fritters out of them. I knew someone who made champagne out of them. And they're very relaxing. They're kind of like lavender. So imagine this. Here we go. We'll paint a picture for you. Pat, I'll use you as an example. You're my guinea pig. How about that? <laughs> you've had a hard day in the garden, right, Pat? It's me. You've been sweating. You're dirty. Your back hurts. Your spouse says, honey, I've drawn you a hot bath upstairs. And you go up, and there it is, with floating lavender blossoms in the bath. And you sink right in. And then he or she comes back up again with a bottle of little elderberry wine and fresh figs from your trees. <laughs> Just lovely, right? Is that <laughs> well, I can't guarantee your spouse is going to do that, but you can grow all those things. <laughs> so yes, elderberry flowers are edible too, and if you want to add some foodscape element to them, you can have the black lace elderberry, which has beautiful purple leaves, very cut leaf, almost like a Japanese maple, really kind of fun. And then my favorite new berry is the honey berry. This is in the honeysuckle family. It comes from Siberia, very winter hardy, and I bought you got to buy two different varieties of these for cross-pollination. And they, they go by names like Blue Velvet, um, Blue Bell, Blue Magic. Anything with blue in them tends to be a honeyberry. And I bought mine from Stark Brothers a number of years ago. And I paid like $15, and they sent me a little stick. And I was like, yeah, right, I just got ripped off. <laughs> but I stuck it in the ground, and lo and behold, it grew. And I had a couple of them, and it grew like a foot tall and wide the first year. Then the second year, it was two feet tall and wide, and it was covered with these berries. These are elongated, kind of cylinder-shaped berries. Have a flavor kind of like a cross between a grape and a blackberry and a blueberry. And they produce two weeks before strawberries. So you get them really early, really delicious. And then when they're done, you've got a nice little shrub. They're actually a nice little, looks like a spirea kind of shaped shrub to them. So really nice uh, plant to grow. As far as I know and I've heard, Unlike other honeysuckle family plants, these are not invasive. They don't seem to be spreading around or the birds don't poop them out or any of that stuff. Uh, so, yeah, and the, even the deer didn't bother them. I had a rose bush right next to them and they decimated the rose bush but didn't bother the honeyberries. So, definitely a nice new plant to try. 
And then I'll end with some edible vines, and of course, the best one is grapes. And if you want to grow table grapes, seedless table grapes, that's a little hard in our climate because we're too cold. You know, most of the seedless grapes you get, like from California or even New York State, uh, the seedless ones don't grow so well here, except for one, this one. It's called Somerset Red. Somerset Red, it's a seedless one. It's also called champagne grapes. Little red grapes, very sweet, no seeds in them, grows really easily. I've been growing them for years uh, up here in, in North Ferrisburg and hardy to minus 30 or so, come back year after year. And you might also think, you see all these vineyards around, you need a big area to grow grapes, but you really don't for table grapes. All you need to have is maybe a two foot wide section across a back of a garage or a barn or something, and you wanna have some trellising, so a pole with some wires going across. And this is in the fall before you prune. You're gonna prune off 70 to 80% of those canes from those grapes every year, every year. So after you prune it, it looks like that, little stubby branches. If you just go up the road to Lincoln Peak and just take a look at what they did there, I, no I noticed that coming down, that's what they look like. So you don't need a lot of space, and so you can fit them right along a wall like this, you know, trellis them up, get a bunch of table grapes, you have three or four plants, it'll be easy to have table grapes right through the summer and the fall. So hopefully all of these gave you some ideas of great plants to grow, some substitution plants to use, uh, some landscape design ideas, and some creative ways to put some edibles in your yard so you have a beautiful foodscape. Thank you all very much. <laughs>
Uh, my position is I try to avoid it at all costs. <laughs> so if you're going to grow fruit trees, uh, especially apples, there are disease-resistant varieties like Liberty, John of Fries, a number of them, Williams Pride. So you don't have to spray for apple scab or, or powdery mildew or blights, or, or not blights, um, rusts and things like that. So that would be the first line of defense. And then if you have a lot of insect problems, like for example, uh, grape, my grapes have Japanese beetles out the wazoo. I love my grapes. And the cherry trees, they love those too. So I've experimented with some organic sprays because I'm an organic gardener. And the one that worked last year worked pretty well. It's called kaolin clay, K-A-O-L-I-N. And it's, it's a kind of potter's clay. You spray it on the on the leaves, and it creates this like a whitish brown film on the leaves. It's kaolin clay, K A K A O L I N, and it's not the most attractive thing. So if you have grapes in your front yard and it's like a real focal point, I'm not sure I'd try to do that. But it does work to keep the Japanese beetles off. They don't like the dustiness of that kaolin clay, and I had to I reapply it a couple times during the summer, but. It did much better. I didn't have the leaves all decimated by the fall. And the same with the cherry tree, too. So there is also a new version of BT. You know, BT is for cabbage worms and Colorado potato beetles. There's a new version called Galleria that is offered, I think, exclusively through this company called Gardens Alive out in Indiana. And this is supposedly is a variety of BT that will kill the Japanese beetle grubs and the adults. So you can do that. And then, of course, if you want to kill the grubs in the soil, beneficial nematodes are the best thing to spray. That you would spray on lawn areas around the shrubs that they were eat, feeding on, like roses and grapes and things of that nature. And you spray them in June, or you can spray them again in early September. That's your Japanese beetle 101. <laughs> yes. No, that, that, that would be a different BT. That's the Dipel or Thuricide, yeah, the Kerstaki, different one. Yeah, same family, though. Yes, sir? Um, uh, clay soil and blueberries, can you put blueberries? In yeah, they don't really like it because blueberries are very shallow-rooted. So if you have real clay soil, I would make a raised bed and amend it really well and then plant in that. And, and spend the time, you know, especially with fruit trees and berry bushes that last a long time, I, the first year we were at our place in Ferrisburg, we didn't plant hardly anything. We spent a whole year developing the soil, building it. We put cover crops in. We brought manure in. So really spend the time building that soil, and it's going to pay off much better down the road. You mentioned sulfur to yeah. acidify the soil. Right. Yeah, so just elemental sulfur. You can get it as a powder or a pellet form. Agway or places like that will sell it. And you want to do that probably in the spring and fall just to make sure you get your pH down to about 5 and do a pH test every few years just to see if it's working. <laughs> all right, well, I have my books for sale. Um, there's information about the trip if you like it. Thank you all very much for being patient. Yeah. <laughs>